Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to class. It's great to see you. Happy belated St. Patrick's Day. I hope you all were able to um, celebrate the holiday. On, um, here we are in week nine. Let's just go through the agenda. Today you'll watch this video lecture. Uh, for homework, you'll read chapter five in the Freeman Freeman book. Um, you'll answer just one text question because a lot of the questions ask about our classrooms. And I know for OPE, some of you aren't in elementary. Um, not everyone's in a public school. Um, and some of you have goofy schedules. So I think we're just going to answer question five. But I would like you to write about a one page written response that addresses what the textbook talks about, which is teaching should be meaningful and purposeful. So in that response, I want to make sure that you understand what that really means. So make sure it's clear that you explain what that means and you give some examples. So I know you understand. So that'll be really your big assignment this week is that written narrative in response to chapter four. So I know you get it. And then question five, you can actually just put that on one doc document and upload it there. Also, we'll continue with our day by day book, our um, cell book right here. Uh, chapter three, we're going to go on uh, to classroom management. Oh, rats. Yes. So um, also, I thought we'd have a little bit of fun. After you read about classroom management, we've talked uh, a little bit about um, strategies and the importance of having routine. And um, now you understand uh, the maps. Oh, the maps are great. We'll talk about that. I do want you to watch this out of control video classroom. It's down here in the video clip. It's really short. It's maybe 15, 20 seconds of a group of students out of control. Really typical in any public school you walk into. And the teacher herself comes up with a little strategy. So the whole, you can stop after one minute. After one minute, you get it. You don't have to watch more than that. I'd like you to respond to how you would manage that classroom. What would you do to get control back to manage the classroom? And then also just briefly touch in her idea. Uh, she has a clapping game activity. What do you think about this idea? So we'll take a couple minutes and please respond that in the discussion board right here. So you'll watch the video. It's short. First read um, um, the CELIC, then watch the video clip, and then add to the discussion board for that. Um, also, I'm going to review here chapter four in our Freeman Freeman text, a super important chapter for the rest of your life. Also for your CST, your content um, specialty test, and your ed TPA teacher assessment you have to do. Um, all of that is chapter four. So I want to make sure that you hit the important things in chapter four. Um, so we'll talk about that. But um, in chapter five, oh no, I guess in chapter four, sorry. I will talk a little bit about the nice to tell and the nice to slapped. So they're right here. They're links. You can understand and learn a little bit about them. So make sure that you take a few minutes and just familiarize yourself with what they are and what they mean. Okay, please get everything uploaded by next uh, Monday. So I have time to really look at it. Um, some of you always do early, so I usually begin looking at it Sunday, Monday, and wrap up Tuesday. Um, okay, so moving on. First, we're going to talk, and I should have put that in the agenda. I want to talk about your maps. Oh, rats. I put them in the in your blue folders. Hold on one minute. I'm going to go get them. I'm going to pause. All right, I'm back. I won't show you all of them. If we were in a traditional classroom, we'd put them all up on the overhead. Um, but I did remove your names. Here's one that's um, typed up. Um, that has the students in, you can see the little classes, wait, in little square blocks there. It's hard to see their names. You don't have to see their names, but the idea that they're in squares. Same thing with this student. Um, this student put her desks in, wait, sorry, this is hard to do. It's kind of squares. And it was interesting because then this student did not. This student put them in rows of threes, so three across. And finally, there was one here that put them in a U shape. Uh oh, sorry, I should have. Yep, this one is in. See these kind of like U shapes? 
anyway, so I, I thought this was interesting that a lot of you had um, different approaches. For grouping the desks, I think any shape often works if you mix it up a little bit. You know, the, the four squares work, you know, and I would suggest every four weeks maybe mixing up the, the orientation, the three, maybe the pairs. Um, a lot of you um, explained how you broke it up. I did want the narrative so I understood how your maps worked. And some of you did not give me the narrative. So if you give me the narrative, I will give you um, full credit. But those that did give the narrative, I really appreciated it because I understood how you grouped according to language level, culture, proficiency. It was interesting. I only had one student, and Lauren, I think it was you, who considered the age of the students. And I think that's one grouping, grouping I, I think that's super important because if you remember being in second, third, fourth grade, being with someone who is your age is important. And especially for older students working with younger ones, pairing a nine-year-old with a seven-year-old doesn't necessarily work for the nine-year-old. For the seven, it's, it's not so bad, but for the nine, you may feel ashamed working with someone who's younger especially if they're same proficiency level. So I think we do really want to consider age when pair, pairing up. I mean, it's okay certainly to do activities together, but when sitting with a desk and coming every day and establishing your routine, and routine is really important, I think we do want to consider age. Also, no one here talked about gender. You gave a lot of different explanations, but no one talked about gender and pairing up, especially if we want to be culturally sensitive, um, a, a student who comes from a really patriarchal male dominated society, I, I think we had our Saudi Arabian student, male, putting him with a woman could be a challenge for him, not for her. Um, the same thing if it's a woman from that culture and putting her with a, a boy, or I should say boys and girls are young, could still really be challenging and you're putting, um, you're dealing with the effect of uh, filter there. Remember, we talked about the effect of do domain um, emotions and attitudes. So I think we do have to consider gender when we are mixing students up and we're crossing culture. So keep those aware. But um, for the most part, the maps were great. I appreciate the narrative, so I understood your um, discussion. Everything I have to put it now, I mixed it all up. It's all in your blue folder and it's in the outbox. So feel free to come get it. The grades are in. Okay, so let's move on to chapter four. Oh, rats, how much time do I have? Okay, I have seven minutes. So hold on, I'm going to pause for a minute. Okay, so here we are back with chapter four, and you can follow along or just uh, take your notes. Really what chapter four talks about a lot of different ways we do it, but what it's stressing is how important it is to teach language and content. We teach language and content over are the days when we just work on grammar and working on grammar and um, aspects of it and mechanics and, and conjugation of verbs and identifying nouns and pronouns. The whole school of second language teaching has moved to the idea that we need to make language meaningful. You know this through Stephen Crash and he's all through this and the idea of comprehensible input and the same idea that we need to meet standards and academic standards. So we want to embed all language teaching in content. And there's a lot of ways we do this and there's a lot of different acronyms and words and we were introduced to that in the chapter. But overall, this is what the chapter is saying is that we need to teach both language and content. This has to be so much a part of your thinking now from this point forward that it's okay to teach a little grammar point when you want to stress it, but we no longer want to approach teaching with merely the whole focus in on just language. Especially now, your content specialty test for New York State, the EdTPA, which is now um, I think 36 states have signed up for it, is your teaching portfolio assessment. You'll do a video, you write your lesson plans, you submit everything. It, if it is not content-based, it's a flunk. Same thing with CST. If you don't understand that you have to be teaching content, it's a flunk. The same thing, I'm going into classrooms and public schools and our students 
student teachers are pushing forward with content. We still have old school teachers that are sitting there and giving students grammar translation, those old dittos and giving them the verb to be. And for 30 minutes, they're just sitting there trying to conjugate the verb to be by themselves alone. That's completely meaningless. We've come so far. So this is really the whole purpose of chapter four. So flipping back um, through, I just want to make sure that we hit the important aspects. So here we go. And I'm sorry. It begins on page 95. Okay, so we have two, it begins with two different types of approaches. One is content-based ESL and one is sheltered English. It's almost the same idea. Content-based ESL means that you're teaching language but you're doing it through content. You're choosing something that's of interest to the students, that's relevant to their lives, that could be used in their class. So it's content-based ESL. This is something you can use the rest of your lives. Sheltered English is almost the same idea, but the idea is that the content comes first. So the science curriculum comes first and you're teaching that content and you're helping support linguistic needs. So, Language is subordinate in sheltered English, where in content-based ESL, the content is subordinate. It's the same idea that it's all using content to teach language, language and content combined. But content-based ESL is really that you're teaching language and you're using content to do it. Sheltered English, you have to get that curriculum across. You, those students have to learn the U.S. presidents. So they're learning the U.S. presidents, but you're going to give your ELL some type of extra support to make sure that they understand the content. That's the basic difference between those two, um, those two thoughts. Both are great. Both are useful. The book talks about the fact that people are moving away from content-based um, instruction, absolutely not. Both are alive and well. They're useful. You're going to see them everywhere you go. Sorry, there's my phone. Hold on one sec. All right, I'm back. I see I have um, only three minutes left. I might have a part two of this lecture. Um, so on page 100, it talks a little bit about content-based ESL, but it also brings up the Lau versus Nichols case, which for those of you that had me for EDU 185, you remember that's when um, um, the state of California actually allowed, um, sued the state of California and San Francisco because they didn't have education in Chinese and there are a lot of Chinese students and it was really instrumental in pushing forward bilingual education. Um, so all of you should be familiar with this idea of Lao versus Nichols and it wasn't, it comes so late, 1974 that this becomes law that we provide bilingual education. So just make sure that you understand that. Um, and oh, let's see, I have Bix and Kelps written down. Um, oh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Cummins talks about Bix and Kelps. I gave you a lecture for that last week. Um, just a brief one. Make sure that you're familiar with Bix and Kelps. Um, and oh, the idea that how long it takes to become proficient in the chapter talked about this as well, that of course, which comes first, your BICs or your CALPs? Good. Your BICs, your basic interpersonal skills. Imagine if um, I put you in, let's say you don't speak French and I put you in Paris and you're there for a summer, three or four weeks in a summer. In that three or four weeks, of course, you're going to be able to say bonjour, comment allez-vous, je suis très bien, um, je voudrais un croissant. You can say a few things in a couple weeks. Those are basic interpersonal communication skills. CALPs are the cognitive academic um, um, skills, the ones that we need for academic work. Those take years to learn, years. So the CALPs take a long time. And this is why it's important that students, um, that we understand that we need content and language. They're going to always need those two types of support. Okay, um, I'm going to go to, sorry, I'm going to go to a second video. So I'm going to go ahead and save this one now and upload a part two. See you later.